Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Mortgage Coach Tuesday Morning Coaching Call, the industry's best sales meeting every week. We are dedicated to your personal and professional success. At Mortgage Coach, we believe that every borrower deserves competent mortgage decisions powered by Mortgage Coach Education. So last week, I hope a lot of you were on the Mitch Kiter um, webinar. I was really proud of that. I thought Mitch did just a fantastic job of answering really important questions around how we can be leaders in this industry and how we can be great salespeople and be great compliant salespeople. Uh, while the call lasted an entire hour, we broke up the questions into you know small videos. So we now have a new um, playlist called Compliance Leadership Quick Hits. Uh, I'm doing a shout out for one, transparency and quoting. Uh, I thought Mitch just netted this out in four minutes. And as industry leaders that are you know, serious about being pros and doing the right thing by buyers and realtors, I just think this is important leadership. Every mortgage coach should listen to this and share it with your executive team, share it with your manager. So when I think of what's required for us to be successful in this business, there's just a quote that goes through my mind a lot. Is, you know, I, and I say this to myself, don't wish it were easier, wish you were better. I mean, Jim Barone is just a fantastic leader. This was something that Darren Hardy, a good friend and a, a guest on the Mortgage Coach Coaching Call, um, put in one of his Darren Dailies last week, or maybe it was two weeks ago. But as we, as we listen to our guest today, and as you think about where you're at in the industry, I want, as, an in, as, a, as a team, as a Mortgage Coach team, to really get around this concept of don't wish it was easier, wish you were better. Because between now and the end of Q1, it's not going to get easier to do business. It's not going to get easier to be successful. But we most certainly need to get better. And when it comes to you know, embracing compliance, embracing the forces that are happening in the market, you know, success is something you attract by the person that you become. And so I'm really excited about today's guest. We've got Tony Blodgett, an industry insider. Uh, Tony's been a, a, a top performing loan officer a top performing um, executive within a company, and now regional leader. Tony, welcome to the call. Thanks, Dave. Glad to be here. Good. Well, I'm looking forward to really drilling down on what is leadership and how can we be better leaders to both realtors and borrowers in the second half of today's call. I'm, I'm going to bring Phil Black into the call now. And Tony, the, while, while Phil is going to be presenting some thoughts and ideas, there will be some time for you and I to provide some color and ask some questions. So, you know, consider yourself my, my co-host when that time comes. Sounds good. Good. So for most of you that are on this call, the, this is not your first mortgage coach call. I mean, I think this marks the fourth, maybe even fifth time that I've interviewed Phil Black. Uh, this isn't going to be so much as an interview as Phil has a, a TED-like presentation that he's going to deliver to us on leadership. Uh, for anybody that's new to hearing Phil Black, why should you listen to Phil Black? Well, I mean, this is a man who's accomplished a lot, has demonstrated a lot of leadership with teams and a lot of personal leadership. As a graduate of Yale, Harvard, uh, was with Goldman Sachs for a period of time, is a former Navy SEAL and Navy SEAL trainer, and then has also been an entrepreneur who was on the Shark Tank and had his first successful uh, transaction as an entrepreneur. So Phil, uh, it's good to have you on the call, and I'm looking forward to hearing what the price of leadership is to you. Thank you, Dave. I think and I'm going to turn the reins over to me, I think. I am, and the reins have been pushed over to you, Phil. All right. Just let me know when you see that on the big screen. I see it on the big screen, my friend. All right. Well, thank you, Dave. I know that quite a few people on this call are leaders in the mortgage industry, either in charge of a branch or a division or a region. And if you don't have a management position at work, you can still be a great leader, as we all know. You may be a leader at home with your family, your church, a different team or organization. There are lots of leadership roles in today's society. And I'd like to talk today about what I believe makes a great leader and what makes great leadership. So before we dive in, I'd like to have a little, a little activity here. I'd like each of you to write down one word that you think best defines leadership. 
Just and, one word. We'll give you a couple seconds to think well, about that. And, and by the way, everybody, I'd like to have you put that in the questions and answers of the GoToMeeting control panel. So I will keep an eye on that. Uh, input, what, what do you think leadership is in one word in the GoToMeeting control panel? Uh, example by Mark Brewer. Uh, confidence by Jim. Uh, preser preservations. Uh, strong. Discipline. Servant. Vision. Support. Charisma. Wisdom. Inspirational. Confident again. And selfless. And I could go on. I mean, the, it's blowing up with what people see as leadership. Wow, those, those are all real time? Yeah, humility, server. Oh, great. Awesome. I was I was listening there for my word, and I haven't I haven't heard it yet, which is uh, maybe good or maybe bad. Obviously, it's tough on when I put you guys on the spot. You guys had about three seconds to do it. I heard some great words: confidence, strong, discipline, servant, wisdom, inspirational, all great stuff. Obviously, there's no right answer here. Um, so thank you all for for participating. It's interesting to me to see what people say about the word leadership since it's thrown around a lot today. And uh, I'm going to get to my word in a few minutes. But before we get there, I'd like to take a look at what definitions can be found online for leadership. And of course, these folks weren't limited to three seconds. Uh, and we'll just go through a couple slides here. For me, leadership is an act, a decision to take a stand by Kendra Coleman. These are in no particular priority order. I just wanted to grab a couple of them if you just wanted to look up leadership online. Leadership is the ability to take an average team of individuals and transform them into, a, into superstars. Leadership is influencing others by your character, humility, and example. Leadership is actions committed by a person or a group that produce an output or result. This one jolted me a little bit. I mean, it, it's just there's not a lot of meat on this bone. I mean, just leadership is actions committed by a person or a group that produce an output or a result. I, uh, I think this guy Prezioso, not, probably not going to be a surprise that he's a, a, uh, a professor at a college. It's just a very, a very academic decision, which to me um, didn't really grab me that much. It just seemed a little bit generic. So I guess my question for you is, is the, the last few definitions that we just looked at, did any of these definitions grab you? Will you remember any of these definitions 10 minutes from now, word for word? Obviously, it's harder to remember a, a phrase versus one word. But none of them really wowed me, and I got to start thinking about what I believe leadership is all about. And I had a hard time coming up with anything that was much better. So I started to think long and hard about how I thought about leadership and to make the challenge even tougher. I limited myself to one word, just like I did with you guys. It just seemed to me that one word is a little bit easier to remember than a sentence, a little bit easier to get your arms around, and sometimes more powerful, too, if you get it right, of course. And mind you, I, I spent more than five to ten seconds thinking about this when I started looking into it. And my hope is that you will remember my word, my one word definition for leadership for the rest of your life. And I know that's a, it's a tall order, but I'm going to give it a shot. And before I get to my one word, I want to review what the average person thinks when they think of leaders and leadership. They may think of reserved parking spots, corporate perks. Titles like CEO, Admiral, Colonel, Madam, the corner office, a lavish lifestyle, salary benefits, stock option packages, executive assistance, jet setting, status, golf memberships, and the list goes on. And while I'm, it's a little bit exaggerated here, I don't, I don't mean to think that everybody thinks that of, of leaders, but I don't think it's that far, especially how it's portrayed in the media today. And what is often lost, I think, or ignored or forgotten or not talked about is the path to leadership. People typically don't just wake up one day a leader. There's a path, and it's often long and often arduous. As you can see in this little picture here, you see there, there are clouds ahead, and there's some winds and, and turns that, uh, that are all part of this path. In my view, the path to leadership is very important. It's not just the end game. It's the struggle. It's the journey that defines leadership, and it's a path defined by sacrifice. It's a path that's anything but smooth, straight, and easy. And therein lies my one-word definition of leadership. In my opinion, leadership equals sacrifice. And if you remember nothing else from this entire presentation, I would love you to remember and reflect on this equation. Leadership 
equals sacrifice. And what I found interesting about this definition or this equation is that it pairs a strong word like leadership with a humble word like sacrifice. And how is that possible? How do we make sense of that? And while this relationship applies to many forms of leadership, I'd like to take a look at leadership in the context of the Navy SEAL community, since it's where I've grown up and, and some, I have some intimate experience there. And before we jump too much into any military jargon, I want to take a little step back and talk a little bit about military uh, rank structure. So we all have the same frame of reference. We're talking the same language and, and have some context here. In the military, the leaders of the troops are known as officers. They're all college graduates. They go through advanced military training. They live in separate barracks. And they often train separately from the enlisted personnel. Enlisted personnel are the non-officers. I apologize for the people who know a little bit about the, about the military, but I, I'd say 50% of the people that I talk to don't understand the difference between an officer and, and an enlisted person in the military. So for instance, if you go to West Point, which is the Army's military college, you graduate after four years as an Army officer, what's called a second lieutenant. If you go to Annapolis, which is the Navy's equivalent of a military college, you graduate as a naval officer, what's called an ensign. And you are then a 21-year-old put in charge of a group of enlisted Army or Navy personnel who are likely to have no more than a high school diploma. These are the privates in the Army and the seamen in the Navy. Uh, a military officer is the equivalent of management in the private sector, and an enlisted person is the equivalent to a line worker in the private sector. Now, it's not quite that simple, but for our purposes, I think you all probably have the picture now. We're going to discuss that as we go forward. Now this image on the screen is the Naval Special Warfare Insignia. It's known as the Trident. It's also called the Budweiser. And it symbolizes the three areas of operation where SEALs operate. The Trident represents the sea. The Eagle represents the air. And the Pistol represents the land. And the acronym SEAL stands for Sea, Air, and Land. In the SEAL teams, only 10% of SEALs are officers. 90% are enlisted. That's just the way the teams are built. Every platoon is made up of 16 SEALs, and two of them are officers. They're in charge of the platoon. Now, there are smaller groups of SEALs that operate together, as we'll soon see, but the 16-man SEAL platoon is typically the biggest operational unit. And as far as the conventional military goes, this is extremely small compared to the Army or, or, uh, or the Marines or, or, uh, or even the Air Force. Now, to an outside observer, SEAL officers may appear to have a slightly elevated status when you compare them to the enlisted SEALs. SEAL officers get paid a little bit more money, live in slightly nicer barracks, they can visit the O Club, which is the officers' club, they get saluted to. It's all part of the military rank structure. And I had the great honor and fortune to be a Navy SEAL officer. And um, probably in about 10 minutes, you're going to question whether honor and fortune are good words to describe this job. But I. It's how I felt and it's how I feel today. Those who become SEAL officers don't get these benefits without paying a high price along the way. And this is where the term sacrifice comes back into play as it relates to leadership. In order to become a Navy SEAL officer, the path is long and arduous with very little room for error. You have to go to a highly competitive college, university, or military academy, do exceedingly well academically, have a spotless record, perform twice as well as the enlisted people do on fitness tests, need dozens of recommendations about character, integrity, and trustworthiness, go through rigor rigorous psychological training. All of this just to be considered as a possible candidate for one of the 25 officer spots that they hand out every year. And only the best of the best make it through to even begin SEAL training, which is when the hard part starts. So getting through all these filters takes tremendous sacrifice. The work that goes into excelling at these intense colleges, academically, athletically, socially, the work that goes into training to crush these fitness exams, the time it takes to gather these recommendations, the years and years of clean living and staying out of trouble with the law, playing by the rules. These are significant sacrifices that are 15 years in the making before you even submit an application. Now, the gentleman pictured here is a SEAL officer candidate at BUDS. BUDS is the acronym for the six-month SEAL training. It stands for Basic Underwater Demolition SEAL Training. And the only things that differentiate him in training from the enlisted guys are that big white stripe down the middle of his helmet. The enlisted guys don't have that stripe. And if you could see those little gold bars on the sides of his collar, those are really the only differences. And while these symbols are small, the difference in how officers are treated during training is anything but small. 
once in, uh, as selected as an officer candidate for the SEAL teams, things only get worse. Expectations are sky high. There's the demand for near perfection on academic tests is insane. And the SEAL instructors absolutely destroy officer candidates during BUDS training for a lot of good reasons. Number one, they want to make sure that the officer candidates can not only handle the training, but they can lead at the same time. It's not only about surviving for the officers, it's about leading men to the worst conditions most of them have ever faced. And number two, the instructors need to show the enlisted trainees that the officer is worthy of their respect. So the harder they crush that officer, the more the enlisted guys will be inclined to follow that officer. And it really makes for a grueling, grueling six-month period of, tr of time for would-be Navy SEAL officers. So again, leadership comes at a high price. The sacrifice that SEAL officers make in order to earn the right to lead other SEALs is extreme. It's not about the money or the officer's club. It's about the sacrifice along the way to earn the trust of the men. During SEAL training, when it's time to eat at the chow hall, officers never eat before the enlisted men. The enlisted guys always go first, and it's a sacrifice, maybe symbolic, uh, perhaps, that the leaders make to gain the trust of their men. It might seem like a small thing, but it has impact. The best officers always put their men before themselves. They sacrifice the comforts and the conveniences for the good of the team. Best officers routinely cover for the mistakes of the men in their boat crew, whether someone was late or out of uniform or missing, missing a piece of equipment. The officer steps up and takes the hit, even if it means a thousand push-ups in a wet and sandy uniform at the end of a long day. The best officers take the blame for their men, even when it means they might get graded down on their evaluation. And when the enlisted guys see that an officer is putting their well-being ahead of his own, the trust explodes. When gear, water, or food is handed out, the best officer gets get whatever is left, if there's anything left. It's the officer's sacrifice in the face of extreme conditions of discomfort, pain, hunger, thirst, that gets people's attention. The enlisted guys see everything. They know everything that's happening around them. And it's this sacrifice that defines success. I'd like to share the story of Lieutenant Michael Murphy, who you see here a Navy SEAL officer who was awarded the nation's highest military honor, the Medal of Honor. Lieutenant Murphy was from my hometown in New York and went to a rival high school of mine, which is why this story really hits home for me. Some of you may have heard or seen this story in this popular book or a movie called Lone Survivor. Well, for those of you not familiar with the story, here's a quick synopsis. Lieutenant Murphy was the leader, also known as an officer, of a small four-person SEAL element that was taking or tasked with taking out a high-value target in the remote hills of Afghanistan. And halfway through the mission, the SEALs were compromised by some goat herders in the middle of the sheer cliffs of this godforsaken place. Lieutenant Murphy decided to let the goat herders go, abort the mission, and take his team to higher ground to make radio call for immediate extraction. And by the way, we're going to go through a couple more slides. These images are not real, of course. They're, they're from the movie Lone Survivor. And while the SEALs made their way up the mountain, the goat herders ran down the mountain and alerted the Taliban to what they saw. And as the SEALs attempted to make radio comms with their base, they saw dozens and dozens of Taliban fighters lining up on the mountain ridge a few kilometers away. They continued to have problems with the radio because the mountains were so steep and the signal could not make it through. And soon enough, hundreds of Taliban fighters were make, making their way toward the SEALs' position. The four SEALs knew that their only chance was to fight, and so commenced one of the most brutal firefights in the history of the SEAL teams. It's speculated that the four SEALs took out over 200 Taliban fighters over the course of several hours. The waves of Taliban just kept coming and coming. Soon into the firefight, two of Lieutenant Murphy's men had been shot multiple times and would likely not survive if they didn't get immediate help. Lieutenant Murphy then made a courageous decision. He gave up on the radio, took a satellite phone, and walked out to a distant ledge, completely uncovered, where he knew he could connect by satellite phone with base camp. Unfortunately, he also knew that he was walking to his death. His teammates pleaded for him not to go. Lieutenant Murphy said it was the only way to let base camp know that they were in trouble 
and that he refused to let them die there on the mountain alone. He walked out onto that ledge with no cover, and in a calm voice, he called for help. Foxtrot Base, this is Echo Platoon. Do you copy? Echo, this is Foxtrot. We read you loud and clear. What is your status? Foxtrot, we're approximately two miles east of our primary extract point under heavy, heavy fire. Two men down. We need immediate cover, fire, and extraction. As he spoke these words, he was being riddled by enemy fire. He repeated the quest for the request several times until he knew the message was confirmed and that help was on the way. He calmly stood up, now bleeding from multiple bullet holes in all parts of his body, and walked back to his men, where he died in their arms. A rescue mission was underway, thanks to Lieutenant Murphy, but unfortunately only one of his men survived. Lieutenant Murphy and his two other teammates died on the mountain. For this courageous act and willful disregard for his own well-being, Lieutenant Murphy was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. Lieutenant Murphy defines leadership. His sacrifice defines leadership. His selfless act to save his men defines leadership. Leaders sacrifice comforts, even their own survival, for the good of the team. Now, I know it's pretty heavy stuff. Um, it's tough for me to even say, but I wanted to hammer home this, this strong contention that I have that leadership is defined by sacrifice, sustained sacrifice in the face of adversity. Obviously, Lieutenant Murphy and his SEAL team were an extreme case, and there's no expectation of, here of a regional loan officer acting in such a way. That's not your job, but I think the, pre the principle remains the same. Great leaders in all phases of life sacrifice for their teams. Parents sacrifice for their children. Coaches sacrifice for their players. And the mortgage industry is no exception. As a leader in the mortgage in industry, it's not about the corner office, the leased Lexus, the high-end wardrobe, the big watch, the flexible work hours, the leads that can be hoarded. Now, don't get me wrong. If you become a leader in this highly demanding and competitive industry, you have earned every one of those perks. You've put in the time, the effort, the education, the risk, the time away from your family, the stress the networking meetings, the rejection, the lack of sleep, the lack of time to exercise and take care of yourself, you have made those sacrifices. And I'm not devaluing that. You have made the sacrifices that it takes to become a leader. But guess what? It doesn't end there. A leader's job never ends. Dave Savage, think about how much you have sacrificed to become a leading voice in the mortgage industry, 20 plus years. The leader who now brings cutting edge mobile technology and education to a new generation of mortgage professionals. Think back on the time, the effort, the learning, the mistakes, the fixing, the tweaking, the financing, the execution of your vision, the leading, and the sacrifice. You are a true leader. And I know that you know that your job is not done. The industry needs your help, and you're on a mission to lead. Said differently, you're on a mission to sacrifice. If you want to stay a leader and grow as a leader, the sacrifice does not stop. Not at work, not at home if you have a family. And they look that way to a casual observer as if you've made it, quote unquote, but it doesn't stop. With additional responsibilities come additional sacrifice. The sacrifices are the price that leaders pay for the trust of their team. And trust is the lubricant that makes it all work. Trust is not an order, it's a feeling. You build that feeling when your team sees that you sacrifice for them. And believe me, they see it and they feel it. If you are a leader who has sacrificed for your team, your organization, or your family, you are, hard, you are in good company. There are many others who did the same. Some people you might recognize. Jesus of Nazareth, Martin Luther King Jr., Mahatma Gandhi, and the list goes on. Leadership equals sacrifice. Thank you very much, Dave. Whoa, Phil, Phil Black, that was uh, an amazing gift to the mortgage coach community. Uh, definitely, you know, makes you dig deep on what is leadership. Uh, again, I, I, I don't know, I kind of feel sorry for Tony Blodgett having to follow up to that. Maybe we should have had you go last, Phil, just to, 
to leave that those those last thoughts on what is leadership in this industry. So, um, Phil, uh, I don't know when you need to jump off the call, but that was that was just a tremendous presentation. I mean, every time I bring you in here, you you make me think. You know, while I saw those slides prior to the conversation, I had no idea how much that would connect with me emotionally and intellectually. I mean, what a great gift, man. I'm glad. Yeah, really. So, so folks, you know, I think it's, you know, it, it, it ties in well to how I kicked off today's call. Because everybody on this call, you're, you are leaders because you're learners. And learners are leaders. You know, you came to this call, you, you, you have a lot of things you could be doing today other than being on a mortgage coach coaching call, but you came here to learn. You came here to sharpen your sword. Hopefully the gift that Phil just gave us connected you, with you both intellectually and emotionally. And I think it also aligns to what I, I said earlier in the call. You know, don't, don't wish it was easier, just wish you were better. And, and, and that's what we're here to do, is we're here to get better. So I'm gonna shift the call from something really high level, something really deep, and we're gonna get tactical because uh, Tony Blodgett is a tremendous leader in our industry, and everybody who's got any level of success in this business and has been in this business for a long time has been through a lot of sacrifice, and if you're on a call and I'm interviewing you, you're really good at what you do. You, you, you're not just good because I think you sound smart and you have good ideas. You've achieved a pinnacle of success that represents the best in this business. So, Tony, um, I don't envy you having to follow up uh, Phil Black but welcome to the call, my friend. <clears throat> well, thanks, Dave. And, you know, honestly, certainly my goal wouldn't be to even have a presentation that got close to what Phil was talking about. I don't think most of us, even those that just heard that message, you know, will ever be able to really internalize what that sort of sacrifice is. And I think that that presentation, you know, should really resonate with you and, and stand alone. I hope for the second half of this call what people get out of this is, you know, with, 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 with the inspiration from, from Phil and really realizing, you know, that it is about sacrifice and taking those extra steps. And sometimes sacrifice can come in small doses. And it may not seem like sacrifice uh, at the time when you compare it to what, you know, the, the Navy SEALs go through or what anyone in, who's putting their life on the line goes through. But there's ways that we can get uncomfortable in our jobs and just go that little extra step. And I, and I hope that they, you know, you can take from what Phil said, and then leverage the things that we're going to talk about uh, here today. So uh, thanks, Dave. And I, I don't mind following Phil. It was great to be on the same call with him. So, uh, so thanks for that yeah. presentation, Phil. Yeah, and so thank you for your service um, to our nation and to, to Morgan's Cup. So, uh, so let's, get, let's get tactical as what it looks like to be a mortgage coach leader in the industry. Uh, Tony, you know, as a leader, you know, not only did you take advantage of the new innovation that we rolled out at the Sales Mastery event, but you've, 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 you've started creating some content to help other mortgage coaches deliver value, and you've created leadership to, to bring to realtors and loan officers. So, so first of all, folks, if you're, you're on this call, uh, one, you may have already downloaded our RateWatch app. You know, you can go and you can either you can put in Mortgage Coach, and you can see our apps. Uh, many of you have already downloaded it. For those of you that have already downloaded, downloaded it and that you're getting value from it, please rate it. Let us know what you think of it. We've already got some great um, feedback from leaders, and this is a great gift to our development team, to Joe Patur, the leader, the president of Mortgage Coach and the leader of this product. But if, if, you're, if you've downloaded it, you're using it, and you're getting value, let us know how you're getting value and let us know what you think of it. Uh, I would like to know um, how many of you have downloaded it, so I'm going to push a survey question real quick so that Tony and I, as we go through this teaching, we know what percentage of you have already downloaded the app and you're getting value, what percentage of you haven't. Uh, Tony, any guesses how many folks on the call have downloaded it? What do you, what do you think the percentage is? Well, gosh, I hope it's a high percentage. Uh, it's got to be over 50% and, and near 75, and I'll be surprised if it's not. All right, well, guys, first of all, I'm getting a small percentage of you that are voting, so give me a push. Please, just in the next five seconds, vote so we can get a big number and we know where you're at. So, so here we go. The, the results are 63% have uh, downloaded it, 38%. So, you know, the majority of you have. That's good to know. Uh, so, so let's get back to what, what this means and, and what is the RateWatch app. And, 
rather than make this a, a product, you know, um, this is this is what we did and how we did it from a from my perspective or Joe Pretor's perspective. Tony, as a as a leader, you created a video for your team and for the mortgage coach community as a whole. But why don't you kind of walk us through what more what what the Rate Watch um, app means to you? How you're using it with realtors and borrowers, and then folks, if you have um, downloaded it, hopefully you have, walk through it, click through it as Tony and I are going through it and showing you how you can use this to be a leader to realtors and loan officers. Go ahead, Tony. Yeah, well, for me, you know, Joe made the mistake of telling me that they were working on this app, you know, quite some time ago. So I kept bugging him, you know, when do I get my hands on the on the Rate Watch uh, app? Uh, because for me, it was such a natural transition. When I, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a regional VP now, and I don't meet with a lot of customers. I still do borrower presentations, but not like I used to. But I would always have my borrowers in my office, and when they were there, I always had the Rate Watch widget on my computer, and it was part of my, you know, every consultation I had with the borrower, I used that to show them what the market's doing, how I stay in touch with the market, and I feel that that part of the presentation really had my borrowers walking away going, wow, I feel like I'm in good hands with this guy. He's got his finger on the pulse of what the market's doing. He, he knows way more about you know mortgage-backed securities and, and their trends and their trading patterns than I do, so I really trust this guy. And I could tell every time I got to that part of my presentation during the borrower consultation, that I was winning points with with my borrowers. So now to have this in the palm of your hand, in my opinion, you know that there couldn't be a better tool to use. And what what I the reason I put the video out and what I wanted people to realize is that you know so many people use Rate Watch as a tool to educate themselves on what the market's doing. They'll watch Dan's videos in the morning, which if you don't watch those every morning, you absolutely should. Um, you know the way he talks about the market and what's going on. You can just regurgitate that same information when you're talking to people because. You know, you're a mortgage person. You go out in the field, people. What are rates doing? You know, you better have an answer to that and an intelligent one at that. So to have the commentary and and to have this in the palm of your hand, so that when you're out talking to borrowers, when you're at a consultation, and you know, the reality is today more and more, not every borrower is coming into your office for a consultation. So now, if you're meeting them somewhere, or uh, if you're out in the field talking to your real estate agents, or whatever the case may be, at an open house or whatever event you're doing, now you have that same tool right in the palm of your hand. And so for me, it was a natural transition to mobile, and uh, I'm really glad it's here, and, and it gives me the tools I need to give people that same level of confidence in me while I'm out in the street. So, so everybody, if you could pull out your app and, and click on the home page. Now, right now, it's green because that's to the benefit of, low, of, of better interest rates. You know, as you can see on my screen, it was red. So, so think of this as wherever the market's at, you are going to, you know, you're going to know whether it's up or whether it's down. And we'll walk through, you know, kind of the details on this. But click on the home page and then turn it sideways. Notice that as you move the phone, it, it displays the numbers in a way that's most attractive and most comprehensive. So, so Tony, uh, if we could, let's walk everybody through and, and let's at least show the day watch. And if you could walk us through, you know, what the day watch is for you and how you use it and how you think loan officers should use it. Yeah, absolutely. So day watch is, is, is a huge part of my presentation as well. Um, obviously, I like, to, uh, I like to show people just, the, you know, the trend of the, of the market and what it's doing and resistance and support and, and using the candlestick charts. But for me, what the day watch does is it brings to, it, 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 it really illustrates for people the volatility that we deal with every day in the market. And so even today, you know, it's a green day and, and the market's up. We've already had one alert here today. But if you look, if you pull up your day watch today, look at just the, the, the ebb and flow of the market throughout the day. Um, I remember way back in the in the day, and I'm sure many of you will remember this before the day of the loan officer compensation rules and the like. You know, we used to love to, to think we were experts and, 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 and play the market and all that stuff. And the reality is that's just a dangerous way of doing business today. So my mindset is that I want to lock a borrower uh, into their rate uh, unless there's just some obvious you know, signs in the market that there's going to be improvement. There's just so much volatility today that I'll use this as a tool to illustrate people what we go through on a daily basis with the gyrations in mortgage-backed securities and, and, and really encourage them to lock in their rate if they're comfortable with the terms and conditions that we've discussed. Show them that you know, it's not just a flat line. It is all over the place. And at any given time, we can have a huge move 
in the market. And just look at the gyrations that go on here in the first couple hours of trading today. And it usually gets people to, to recognize that this isn't something they want to play with. Let's get our rate locked in. Let's get that deal done, disclose, and move it down the line. So I use it as kind of you know sealing the deal, if you will, on getting people to commit to the rate that we've discussed. Got it. So I want everybody, if you didn't already do it, in the upper left-hand corner, there's a menu option, and click Day Watch. So just to be clear, Tony is using this to create urgency around getting locking in rates. So think of this as a pulse check on the Day Watch, and then rotate it. You know, so you're looking at it in a in a portrait, and then turn it into a landscape. So I just want to make sure everybody really has a clear view on how to use that. So, so now, you know, Joe and the team were passionate about making, you know, the market really, really simple and very attractive to non-mortgage mortgage people. So if you look at most graphs and charts in the industry, they really are designed for economists, accountants, people that like tracking numbers. You'll notice that the colors that we used are attractive to, 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 to consumers, to families. Uh, I knew that Joe and the team and the design team had really nailed it when I was showing this app to my high school daughter and she's like, Dad, you finally did something cool. You made numbers cool. So, so these, the way they presented the numbers, whether it's the colors and the graphs and charts, it's simple, it's consumer friendly, and it's the way that families want to make mortgage decisions. So, so Tony, let's talk and walk through a little bit about how we've integrated it with Edge and you know, as a mortgage coach user who's delivering mortgage coach experiences to buyers and realtors, how the app addresses some value there. Yeah, well, but before I, I transition to that, I want to point out one other functionality here, and it's the fact that you can go to the home page, and let's say you want to go back and look at a 30-day view, and let's go back to right around September 10th, September 11th, right? The rate, you know, there was a huge drop down. We lost about 75 basis points. You can actually go and find these extremely volatile days. If you really want to illustrate for somebody, you know, what sort of volatility we can see, find a, a day like that where we had a massive movement, then go to your day watch. In the upper right-hand corner, there's a little thing that says date there. You can go back and select any date and show the day watch for that day. So sometimes, you know, if, if we're in a day where you're not seeing the volatility, but you want to ex explain to someone what could happen, go back to September 11th. Look at it. I mean, the market dropped. We had an alert. It kind of went back up as if it was going to recover, but then it just fell off a cliff. You know, so sometimes finding those really extreme examples and the day watch functionality allows you to do that. So hopefully that that's helpful. That's something I've done in the past as well. Um, but so let's talk about hey, real hey, real quick, I just again want to make sure everybody connects the dot on the screen that I'm looking at right now in the upper right hand corner where it says date. Click on that date and go to a different date. Just you know, scroll to a different date, and then click back onto the screen, and you'll notice that we go to that date. So again, I just want to make sure that we drive that experience that Tony's showing to everybody. In the upper right-hand corner, regardless of whether you have it in portrait, there's the date, or in landscape, the date is in the upper right-hand corner. So go ahead, Tony. OK, so, so incorporating Edge. now. Um, there is also a tab here that you can go and you can look at your edge views for the day. So now you, you typically you'll get an email when someone views your edge report and now you just have it right here on the application. So it makes it much easier to just quickly see all of the views that you've had. I know, I know we're going to talk maybe in a minute here about a, a, a edge presentation I did yesterday, um, but uh, I got uh, you know a number of, of views from that. I can quickly just see the views that have come through. So now you're kind of seeing what you're doing in the um, in the uh, uh, in Edge here il illustrated in the application, and of course, just like the other um, uh, Day Watch page, you can hit the date and you can go back to different dates. And this is also something when you're out with your real estate agents and you're talking to them that when you refer a borrower to me, I'm going to give them a you know this sort of a presentation using this Edge tool, and I'll have right in the palm of my hand. Uh, an update on when it is that they viewed my uh, my content and whatnot. So it's just uh, again something that don't keep your phone in your pocket. Show people how you're using this tool. Beautiful. So keep it rocking, Tony. I know we've got other features that we want to share. Uh, let's talk about commentary and how you're using that. Yeah. So you know, I um, 
I watch Dan's video every morning, and um, and then there's also some other expert commentary in there. And for me, sometimes you know I'm I'm friends with Dan on on Facebook, and so I'll see his post there. Um, but sometimes lately, now that I got the app, now that I got this application downloaded, I'll just go right there and click on the link and and watch the video there. It keeps all of them right there, concise. And again, if you're out in the field and you want to show somebody. You know, here's the kind of commentary I'm getting every morning, you know, and Dan's been spot on on the market. I don't know if you guys watch Dan every morning, but oh my gosh, you know, he's really predicted, you know, most of the movements that we've seen in the market. And, um, you know, I think that letting people realize that every day you're soaking in this information, staying on top of what the market's doing, and here's an easy way to be able to just quickly pull this out, show it to them real, real life, in person. Here's the kind of content I get every day, um, and it just has it all in one nice little little package here. So, that's so everybody, I yeah, and I just want everybody to see I am actually showing my iPhone on the screen right now. You'll notice I could just go to tomorrow, and boom, there's there's what happened in the market. You know, I can go back several days and and see that was obviously a, a holiday or excuse me a weekend. See what was happening in the market. So in the upper left hand corner. You know, this is, you know, right here, this is your menu, and we've got the home page, we've got the date watch, we've got alerts, and we've got edge reviews, which again, from a speed to lead perspective, I'm able to see who viewed that lead, and if I have the phone number put in there, I can just quickly call them back and get to people just as quickly as possible. So, so I think we've gone through this, uh, let's see, any other particular um, let's walk through the customization of it really quick. In terms of customizing the charts, you, you have custom features, so you can get as detailed as you want. You can schedule alerts, so while we're pushing alerts when there's midday rate changes and the, the, the possibility of that, you can schedule just to have regular alerts come, and, and you can adjust the charts and the coupon dates. So, Tony, what are some other key elements? You know, I know when you did this video and you were showing people how to use it, you just really focused on this is not just education for you, but this is something to share. And I think you've said that a few times, but just so we net this out before we transition to the other part of our sharing today, you know, give, you know, speak to your team, your loan officers, you've installed this app. What do they go do today? What do they go to do tomorrow? What are some of the scripts that you would use as you share this with home buyers and realtors? Sure. Well, the first thing that you need to do is you need to get familiar with the application yourself. I mean, you just need to spend some time getting to know how to maneuver through it because otherwise you're going to pull this out and you're going to want to give a, a presentation to someone utilizing the application and you're going to be kind of fumbling all over yourself. So the first thing you got to do is you got to educate yourself on the different functionality, the things that we've talked about today. Go through them, practice them, um, you know, put in your support and resistance, understand you know, how that's going to work. And, and as far as the scripts go, Dave, i got to be honest with you, um, the more that you educate yourself on what the market's doing, the more that you're going to know what to say based on what the market's doing at that time. Because we see patterns develop over and over again um, with the candlestick charts. And, you know, my script one day is going to be different than my script the next day, but the goal is going to be to let them realize that I, that I, I understand what the market's doing, Certainly, I have no crystal ball, or I would be, you know, a mortgage-backed security trader, and I'd probably be retired by now. So there is no crystal ball, but this gives us an indicator. And at the end of the day, remember, my goal is for them to recognize that I'm an expert at, at at understanding the mortgage market, and I want them to lock in their rate. You know, those are really the two things I want to get across. I, I I know what I'm doing. I keep my finger on the pulse of what's going on, and my best advice is to let's lock our rate and let's move forward and go get another transaction. Um, so I wouldn't say I have a specific script I use every time. It just it changes, and frankly, a lot of it's going to be based on what Dan says in the morning. You know, you're going to listen to the commentary. You're going to build. Here's what I you know understand about what the market's doing today. And on those days when you're out meeting with someone, that's going to be what you're talking about. Beautiful. So so mortgage coach leaders, everybody on this call, you are a leader because you're learning today. So make sure you've downloaded the app. Make sure you're using it. Make sure that you're sharing it with buyers and realtors in a context that makes sense. For, for leaders like Tony who are on this call, we would love for you to create videos like the one that Tony did and share that with other people on your team. You know, it's, it's just it's fantastic. So, 
so when I, you know, was listening to your call, you know, this really connected with me. I'm not going to read this out loud for everybody, but the, the concept, that this is not just here to educate yourself. This is here to share. It makes you an expert. It helps you give them a higher level of confidence so that when you do give them advice, they really trust your advice. So again, everybody, make sure you, you know, you're a mortgage coach later, get it downloaded, get confident with the conversation. And if you are a teacher and trainer, uh, we would love for you to help create some content to teach and train all the loan officers that you lead and to share that with the mortgage coach community to keep this going. So again, you can just type in mortgage coach, uh, whether you're an Android or an iOS, and if you've already downloaded it, if you've already getting value from it, please give us a review. That is how you say thank you to Joe Petur, our president. That is how you, you let our development team, our designers, all the amazing people at Mortgage Coach that are sacrificing and working hard to help innovate for you guys so that you guys have new and better ways to deliver value. So I know we're going to try to get Jeremy Forcier on the call. Jeremy, by any chance, have you, you joined the call? Yeah, what's happening, Dave? Hey, man. So uh, I, I asked Jeremy to come to the call because he was with me at Sales Mastery when we unveiled RateWatch. And Jeremy, uh, to say he was excited about it was an understatement. And before I knew it, he was already, you know, posting it on Facebook. And I think when you did it, you were like, is that okay? You know, I didn't steal your thunder, did I? So you've been getting some value from RateWatch for a few weeks now. Uh, if you could share with folks what you're doing, how you're doing it, and maybe subscripting on the kinds of conversations that you're having. Sure. So, uh, yeah, it, it, it's a fantastic day. Thank you. You and Joe uh, really hit a home run. I think that this is the best piece of technology that you guys have put out um, since the initial video, uh, you know, screen capture that you guys put together, I don't know, back in 2007 or eight. But it's absolutely awesome. Um, how I'm using it is real simple, is that I find I'm not a big texter, okay? The reason why I'm not a big texter is that you, there's no way for me to effectively process a text inbox unless I do it right there in that sentence. And it really bothers me. It's one of the things I talk about all the time with my team. It's annoying to me, um, and I just can't you know, process it appropriately and create processes behind it. Now, with that said, I think that we all know that we're in a time where lots of people text message, all right? My, my clients text me. Um, even if I do a good job of training them not to text me, if it's important, you still get text a lot of the time, and you have to respond uh, to that. So, for example, yesterday, uh, Lombardi went to contract Friday. She's kind of a freaky uh, borrower that I'm working with, and very nice lady, but, you know, the type of person that this morning already I've had three voicemails from her, okay? It's just like a, if you don't call back in eight seconds, you think something's wrong, and she needs information quickly right now. So uh, she, um, you know, with those voice messages this morning, followed up with a text as well. Hey, I really want to, you know, know about the interest rates this morning. I want to lock in, and I don't want to have to go to USAA. They quoted me 3.875 percent. Blah 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 blah. So all I did, I was in a meeting, was took a screenshot of the Rate Watch app and text her a picture of it and said, hey, um, take a look at this. This is how all the rates move, just like we talked about yesterday. Looks like you're in a great position to lock with me today, and I know that we can match or beat, you know, USAA, blah, blah, blah. All she did was text back, great, awesome, thank you so much, that sounds great, let's move forward. So my point is, is that I didn't do anything spectacular as far as feeling desperate or that I had to sell or that I had competition. But I was able to satisfy her need for information the way that she wanted it in a text message that was visually pleasing, that gave the information that I wanted uh, her to have, and then she moved forward with me. So I think that's just one example of a way to use it. Another is yesterday I was meeting with someone at Starbucks. This was just a business person. He owned a solar company. And we were meeting on how can I help finance, you know, more of your clients. Um, solar panels without them having to do a solar loan, it really doesn't make a lot of sense. And he, one of the questions he asked me is, well, you know, how do you watch, you know, the, uh, the interest rate market? How do you know when it's a good time to lock or a good time to close? I said, well, I'm so glad that you asked. Um, I pulled out my phone, pulled up the rate watch app, and I go, look it, this is real-time trading. 
this is how it works, and I can monitor all the lenders. So anyone that you refer over to me, not only is going to get great customer service and communication, but they're going to have access to me always making sure I'm on top of the market to take advantage of great opportunities for them because I'm plugged in. And it blew his mind. He went, wow, how do I get access to that? And whenever someone asks you a question like that, Dave, how do I get access to that? That's when you know you're really winning. You have a great product and you have something that uh, everyone doesn't have access to. So it really positions you as the expert as well. Beautiful, guys. So, Jeremy, thanks for jumping on in between meetings. And would love to have you stay on. Uh, Tony and I are going to keep this conversation going. We're going to transition to a story that happened over the weekend and, and, and focus on another way to bring leadership. But feel free to jump back in and add value to the conversation as we go. Will do. Got it. So everybody, get it downloaded. And if you're using it and if you're getting value from it, let us know what you think about it. So here's how the story unfolds for the next part of the call. So on Saturday, I'm reading the Crispin report, and I see this you know, post around millennials aren't buying homes. I see a great mortgage coach later, Amy Tierce, you know, jumps in, is talking about how the attitude has changed from you know, the boomers around home ownership. And I'm just thinking to myself, you know, millennials, many of them, it's just a question of, of getting better education. You know, and putting that education on their mobile device. And again, I'm Mr. Mortgage Coach, so I can't help but think, man, why, why isn't Mortgage Coach mentioned in this post and how we are the way to educate millennials? I'm like, we got to get in this conversation. So then on Sunday, Tony Blodgett just does this rant on, on anyways, Tony, I don't want to steal your thunder. What was your rant about? <laughs> well, I rant a strong word, but um, you know, I was I was I was frustrated. You know, I, um, I I went out and about on Saturday, and I had to run. Or excuse me, Sunday. Um, you know, no no Seahawks football, so I had to go and, and run some errands. And so there's a shopping center down here. Uh, there's a Costco, and so I drive in there, and there's this huge area that they just cleared all this land. And I'm thinking there's going to be a movie theater or something going there. And what I see is this huge sign of a new mega apartment complex going in. Now, I live, well, that's my backyard in that picture right there. So you, I live out in, out in the stick. So it's not like I'm in the middle of the city where you expect to see a bunch of apartment complexes. And then as I'm rolling down, I go to Costco. There's a huge brand new apartment complex here in uh, next, next to Costco. And then I'm, I'm driving down the road to the grocery store, and there's another huge apartment complex. And it really just it kind of it kind of made me angry, to be honest with you, as I saw all these apartment complexes. It's not because I hate people that live in apartments, but to me it's a sign of where you know these large developers think that the state of home ownership is. It, it tells me that more people are going to become renters than are going to become homeowners. And as a person who's passionate about home ownership and what it can mean for your family, you know, long term, you know, I got a little frustrated. So I put out this uh, this little video sharing with people, you know, hey, it's not as hard to buy as you think it is. And you know it's unfortunate that we're giving these developers a reason to build all these complexes. That that was kind of my rant. So so the story goes on because I I listened to that and then I you know I had just seen the Christman post and let's face it there's been a lot of press around millennials and what an opportunity it represents. Both we want to win their business and let's face it in our industry we want to have more millennials come to work for us and become loan officers. If you're a manager on this call, how do we attract millennials to being part of our organization, our culture? So, you know, so I, I kind of give, again, don't take the word out of context, Tony Brandt. It's just, you know, it's sharing a view in a passionate way. And, and so I, I texted Tony and I'm like, hey, you know, where is your mortgage coverage versus own analysis? So Tony never replies to me, you know, in the day yesterday. He's like, did you see it on Facebook? And I'm like, what? So, so Tony went and put together a mortgage coach rep versus own, and and again, I'm, I have a lot of passion on this. In fact, Ryan Hill, I see your 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 text coming through here. You know, him and I have been talking about doing a show on on millennials and how we can bring leadership to the industry. One, to win their business and help them buy homes, and two, how we can we can get them on the mortgage coach team and we can bring them into the industry. So, Tony, why don't we walk through this rep versus own? And then I'll connect the dots on you know all the various opportunities that it represents to mortgage coach leaders in today's market. Sure. 
So, um, so yeah, so I put that out, and, and really it just came from a, a place of passion about home ownership and, and, and frustration with what I was seeing here just in my town. And, and you know, I wonder if this is going on in everyone else's town, too. I mean, i got to imagine it is. And so, you know, you, you made me think about it, and so I started putting together an edge pre presentation, a rent versus own yesterday. And uh, I, I just chose a, a, a scenario. I have a couple of rental houses. You know, they rent for, you know, around 1500 bucks a month. So I put together a, um, a quick analysis. I used 1575 as the monthly rent, and then I used two comparisons of a USDA loan and an FHA loan. Now, I know there's lots of other programs, but my, my goal here was to talk to people about, you know, that these are loans that you can have some credit challenges, you can have, you know, little to no money down, and, and I thought it was a good you know, just a good example. So I just did the two and uh, and quickly threw this together. And I was pretty surprised to see how the numbers turned out. And I posted it on Facebook as a follow-up to my, my rant, if you will, and said, hey, you know, here's a visual way of, of, of looking at what I was talking about yesterday. And it turns out that, you know, for about the same monthly payment, you can buy a home right now for about $250,000, which in our area, you know, is going to be a, a decent home for you and your family. But more than that, it's illustrated so eloquently how much you know your net worth is going to go up over the next 15 years. And uh, I even referenced, you know, 15 years seems like a long time, but then I realized that my 20-year high school reunion is next year. So you know, time does fly. I feel like I just got out of high school. But um, you know, so I referenced that and showed people, you know, the the $225,000 there about net worth increase in, in, in owning a home, and um, and talked about just in the next five years. You know how much they would uh, their net worth would would be up and and so it was it, it, I, I was to be honest with you when I put it together I haven't done a lot of these lately and it made me realize that if you're not doing rent versus own analysis right now and putting those out to your realtors taking them to your open houses that you're doing with your realtors the numbers because of affordability being so good right now the numbers work out beautifully there isn't a better way to illustrate that you know millennials should be buying homes. And this is the kind of information they're going to want to see. This is the kind of education that if we, we need to kind of have this, I call it a one-way conversation with the younger generation, that home ownership is, is and, and, and always will be one of the best things that you can do because so many people's opinions have been jaded by the last 10 years of what we experienced through 2006, 7, 8, and the drop in the market, and people saw you know, maybe their parents lose their homes or even friends of theirs who, who were, you know, recently bought homes and, and it caused a situation. And we need to kind of re reprogram people that, uh, that, 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 that that's a small window of time. And frankly, due to, due to that, now is the best time to probably go out and buy a home. So, Absolutely. So, so, folks, you know, this is how millennials want information. They want transparency. And, and where do they want that transparency? They, they not only want it on their desktop, but they want it on the devices that they love most. They want it on their mobile devices. Let's face it, this is where not just millennials, not just Gen Xers, I mean, look around, folks. We're watching TV, and we have our iPads open at the same time. So, so mortgage coach professionals, everybody on this call, you are uniquely armed with an amazing way to deliver education, you know, charts and graphs around financial decisions, home ownership, and then putting that on their mobile devices. This is actually Tony's report. I mean, I clicked on this from his Facebook page on my iPhone. You know, so this is a real live, I went from social to boom. I went from an iPad to boom. So, so we all know that the new generation is, is where the action is over the next five years, but these slides from the call I did with Stephen Harney Steve Harney, this is, this is this year, guys. A lot of people are buying homes. A lot of realtors want your leadership, and, and you're uniquely gifted to do it. So as a mortgage coach, you've got mobile. You've got video, so you've got authenticity. You've got transparency. You're delivering education in a simple way, and you have video. As a mortgage coach leader, you are armed with a tool better than any other loan officer in America, and, and you can help bring home ownership to millennials. And so, by the way, if you are um, this type of loan officer and you're competent in delivering this, you're going to win more business. And by the way, every leader and manager on this company, if you want to attract millennials to your culture, if you want them to come to work for you, you need to have tools and solutions like we have at Mortgage Coach 
so that you're giving them exactly what you want. So this is a conversation that I'm starting. I'm, part of it is preparation for a call that I'm going to be doing with Ryan Hills, another fantastic mortgage coach leader, is I want to interview millennials. I've already interviewed dozens of them to find out who do they want to come to work for in the mortgage industry. And I want to interview them to bring strategies and ideas to win their business. So if you are a millennial, if you know a millennial who's a mortgage coach leader, please either reach out to me at David Mortgage Coach or introduce me to leaders in our industry that are millennial leaders. So I wanted to bring this idea and I want to start this conversation. So, so guys, you know, as I started the call, don't wish it was easier, just wish you were better. This, you can be better than fee worksheets. You can deliver more mobile experiences. You can go from text to mobile, whether it's at the point of sale or whether it's at an open house. Now Mortgage Coach Joe Couture and our product team of designers, we've innovated the point of sale experience, we've innovated the open house experience, and now we've innovated putting interest rates in your back pocket. You now have a mobile app in your back pocket so you can drive urgency and value. Uh, so again, mortgage coach, get to work, guys. Hopefully, uh, you're going to remember Phil Black's words. You're going to think about who you need to become, and and it's just going to be about sacrifice. You know, do what you need to to create these habits and these best practices. So every Tuesday, I'm doing these calls where we're providing ideas and leadership. Every Thursday, we're training you. So if you don't know how to do a rent versus own analysis. Come to Thursday's coaching call at 9 o'clock, and we will make sure you know how to do a rent versus own analysis. If you're having challenges with the app and you want to know how to customize it, you want to know how to use it better, come to the training. We'll be there for you. And if you're new to the mortgage coach and you're a beginner and you haven't created 20 reports before, come to our Friday beginner course. So some last thoughts and reminders. You know, make sure you share this. Uh, by the way, I, Mark Bruner, I put this in here. I know we're a little bit over. I'm going to push the call a couple minutes because I want to get this question answered for Mark. Uh, Jeremy, are you still on the call by any chance? All right. So Tony, this was a question that Mark Brewer put in the Mortgage Coach Facebook page, and I want to make sure we get it answered. Um, you know, what are the needs of top 25 realtor, realtors, 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 top realtors? What are some of the needs that they have in your local markets? Well, I, you know, I think the number one thing that a top realtor is looking for is the ability to partner with uh, a lender that they can confidently refer their borrowers to. Not just confident because they're going to know that when they refer them over, they're going to have a predictable, um, you know, experience, which is very important to your level of referability. Right? You have to be predictable. You, you have to. Your referring partner needs to know that each time they send someone to you, regardless of who that person is, they're going to have a similar experience every time. So that's one thing they're looking for is consistency and referability of, of their partners. And, um, you know, the second thing I think is you, know, you got to close loans on time. It's really simple, but you need to be able to illustrate to your top producing realtors that part of what you bring is not just consistency, but that you can get your loans done and you can get their paycheck turned back around to them you know, those are the things that I would emphasize if I were meeting with a new realtor about why they would want to refer their borrowers to me. Beautiful. So, I mean, we could go on, and Mark, I'll bring that question into future calls in more detail, but at the end of the day, a consistent, unique experience that has obvious value, and absolutely, you need to deliver on your promises. So, leaders, remember to share the Mitch Kiter uh, call with your leaders. Make sure, at a minimum, you listen to the video on transparency and consistency. Uh, this call, like all of our calls, has been recorded. And not only can you access it at our YouTube channel, but you can watch it on your mobile device. Thank you, Sean, for taking a picture of you watching a coaching call uh, from your living room. Uh, because remember, this advice is available. Share it with your leaders and connect with us. Make sure that, you again, last reminder, to give us a review, let us know what you thought of it. And as we wrap up this call, sorry for going a few minutes over, but I just think between Phil Black, Jeremy Portier, Tony Blodgett, we knocked it out of the park, we could go over a couple minutes. So Tony, any last words before we wrap it up? I got two, thought, uh, two thoughts here as we wrap it up. One, you know, 
we talk about sharing the, the Rate Watch app with referral partners and borrowers, but you're never going to do it unless you're confident in how you use the tool. So download it and then play with it. You know, you have to get comfortable with it first. Once you're very comfortable with navigating through it, you're much more likely to pull it out in one of those conversations. And the second thing that I hope you take away from this is go do a rent versus own analysis right now. Just do one up on your computer, work through it, and see what it looks like. And then find out who can I share this with that is going to bring value. I got to tell you, I am not doing a lot of loans these days, Dave, because of my, my role. But that video had over, I think, 20 views on it. I had a number of phone calls and messages from people about, you know what, you've inspired me. I want to buy a home. You know, I, I, so you, know, you will make a difference with this. It's a great strategy. If you need something new to go out with today, make it the rent versus own and go find someone to share it with. Right on. So as you leave today's call, please let us know what you thought of today's call on a good to great uh, basis. Everybody have an awesome week. We'll see you next week. And Tony, thanks again for making it on today's call. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for having me. Bye, Bye everybody.